Millions of lives were affected by that 1896 Supreme Court decision. And in fact, we're still feeling the consequences today under the doctrine of separate but equal, Plessy versus Ferguson allowed that public facilities, including schools, could be segregated by race. The decision effectively ensured that for the next 60 years or so, African-American students were relegated to an inferior status. And African-American teachers suffered a similar fate. One of the first people to recognize the need for an organization for teachers in black schools was J.R.E. Lee, Dean of Tuskegee Institute. In 1904, Lee founded the National Association of Teachers in Color Schools to give black teachers a national forum to address their concerns for African American students. The organization would later become the American Teachers Association. In 1926, NEA and the National Association of Teachers in Color Schools embarked on their first combined venture a joint committee formed to battle the refusal of the Southern Association of Schools and Colleges to evaluate and accredit black schools, a decision that effectively prevented any black student from attending college. The efforts of the joint committee prevailed and black schools were accredited. The two associations worked together to improve conditions for African American students and teachers for 40 years. Meanwhile, the beginning of the last century brought a growing unrest among the nation's teachers about the low salaries and poor working conditions experienced across the country. At the 1903 convention, NEA member and Chicago teacher Margaret Haley led a demonstration to focus attention on the plight of public school teachers. In response, NEA released the first statistical report on economic conditions of employment in public education. Professionalizing the teaching profession became paramount. In 1909, the first teacher tenure law was enacted thanks to NEA members in New Jersey. In 1918, members in Memphis held the nation's first teacher strike and won higher salaries for their members. A year later, the first statewide retirement system was put in place once again in New Jersey. When the NEA celebrated its 50th birthday in 1907, membership had reached 5,044. Three years later, Ella Flagg Young became the first female president. Women continued to play an ever-increasing role at all levels of the association and women's rights remained an important issue. In 1912, NEA voted to support the fight for women's suffrage and two years later was at the forefront of the movement in equal pay for equal work. The policies and the direction of the association had always been determined by delegates who took it upon themselves to attend the annual convention. That all changed in 1920 when the convention became a representative assembly comprised of locally elected delegates, each who had a vote and say in the association's direction. In 1921, 463 local affiliates sent elected delegates to the annual meeting in Des Moines. One of the first orders of business was the creation of American Education Week, designed to improve literacy after World War I and still going strong today. Improving students' achievements and making education accessible have always been goals of the association, both in the U.S. and around the world. NEA helped found the first international group for educators in 1923, an organization that's grown to become Education International. And in 1941, the association lobbied for the GI Bill of Rights, which was passed in 1944. The bill has allowed over 2 million veterans to attend college, making higher education no longer a privilege of the elite. In 1937, NEA created a separate membership category for college students who were studying to become teachers. I'm Aisha Wells, a physical education student here at Florida A&M University and a member of the Student Florida Education Association and the Student NEA. After J.R.E. Lee left the American Teachers Association, he went on to become president of Florida A&M and has inspired students like me ever since. His philosophy reminds me of one of the core values of the NEA, equal opportunity. We believe public education is the gateway to opportunity. All students have the human and civil right to a quality public education that develops their potential, independence, and character. All right, class dismissed. Bye, Sally. Equal opportunity.
two words that paint a picture of a possibility. But in the early 1950s, for millions of Americans, it was more like an impossibility. 50 years later, the legacy of Plessy versus Ferguson was well entrenched. For minorities, the separate but equal doctrine had resulted in inequalities in all facets of life, including public education. Then in 1954, the Supreme Court made a landmark decision that became one of the most important events in both education and civil rights history. In Brown versus Board of Education, the court ordered desegregation of the nation's public schools, reversing Plessy versus Ferguson and bringing about a change that many thought would never come and many hoped would never happen. Black teachers contributed significantly to the financing of Brown versus the Board of Education. In fact, the American Teachers Association gave more money to the team's legal defense fund than any other single black organization. But success proved a double-edged sword. School districts in 17 states used the court-ordered desegregation as an excuse to fire hundreds of black teachers and administrators, and the students fared no better. In 1957, President Eisenhower was forced to send troops to Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. A thousand soldiers from the 101st Airborne Division of the United States Army were sent to protect nine African-American students who had been denied access to their rightful place in the formerly all-white high school. At the national level, NEA continued to advocate for change, refusing, for instance, to hold representative assemblies in cities that discriminated against delegates based on race. And the NEA-ATA Joint Committee, originally formed in 1926, first talked about unifying the two associations as early as 1945, but there was steadfast opposition from some affiliates. Now, in the wake of school desegregation, the 1964 Representative Assembly passed a resolution requiring racially segregated affiliates to merge and talks to merge, the National Association began in earnest. Despite the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, black teachers and others were continuing to fight discrimination and segregation in all areas of their daily lives. They I want to say to the people of America and the nations of the world that we are not about to turn around. Civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. told his followers that change needed to happen from the inside. So new leaders would need to be elected, but how? Even though the 15th Amendment to the Constitution in 1870 gave all men the right to vote, Many states use various methods to prevent people of color from voting, including literacy tests, poll taxes, threats, and even violence. The NEA-ATA Joint Committee sent leaders and staff to help teachers in Selma, Alabama launch a voter registration campaign for black educators under the slogan, Fit to Teach, Fit to Vote. The teachers joined 600 others on March 7th 1965 on a march from Selma to Montgomery to protest voter registration abuses. The group got only as far as the Edmund Pettus Bridge before state troopers put in place by Governor George Wallace stopped them with sticks, guns, pistols, and tear gas. Two weeks later, after the press coverage of the violence left the nation stunned and horrified, Dr. King led a much larger group on a five-day march all the way to the state capitol. Five months later, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965 into law. Meanwhile, after years of intense negotiation, NEA and ATA agreed to merge at the 1966 Representative Assembly in Miami. As the delegates sang, the presidents and the executive secretaries of the NEA and ATA signed a unification certificate, bringing the two organizations together at last. In 1968, NEA elected its first black president, Elizabeth 
Duncan Koontz. The same year marked the creation of a human and civil rights division within the association to focus on protecting the rights of education employees and the students around the country. They also uphold to this day the long-standing ATA tradition of granting human and civil rights awards to individuals and affiliates who expand education opportunities for minority students and educators. The merger between NEA and ATA had a far-reaching impact, not only for black teachers and students, but also for other minority populations, including women. Three months after the merger, NEA sponsored a major conference on bilingual education and the concerns of Spanish-speaking students. The NEA conference led directly to the passage of the 1968 Bilingual Education Act, a great legacy for Braulio Alonso, who became NEA's first Hispanic president in 1967. NEA's dedication to ending the discrimination and inequality experienced by all minority groups date from as early as 1899, when it established the Department of Indian Education to research how the government policies were negatively affecting the education of Native American children. During World War II, the association was one of the few national organizations to speak out against the interment of Japanese Americans. Protecting the rights of students and members and keeping them safe in and out of school has always been part of the special mission of NEA. The face of public education has changed in the last 50 years. We know, we've seen it. I'm Paul Hubbard, Executive Secretary of the Alabama Education Association, a state affiliate of the NEA. And I'm Joe Reed, Associate Executive Secretary. We've held these positions for the last 40 years. We've lived through these changes every day. We believe strongly in NEA's vision and values, like democracy. We believe public education is the cornerstone of our republic. Public education provides individuals with the skills to be involved, informed, and engaged in our representative democracy. In a just society, we believe public education is vital to building respect for the worth, dignity, and equality of every individual in our diverse society. But in spite of the changes happening across the country, Inside the halls of the NEA, it was still business as usual, a fact that did not sit well with an increasingly unhappy segment of the membership. For although the 100-year-old organization had been created by teachers, it actually was and always had been governed and controlled by administrators. By the 1960s, classroom teachers were fed up with low wages and the lack of job security and respect. Local affiliates began to look for ways to gain control of their professional lives. Unionization, something once never thought of for teachers, suddenly seemed to be the best way to gain equal footing with administrators. It wasn't an entirely new concept. In fact, in 1959, members in Wisconsin became the first in the nation to gain the right to bargain collectively. Teachers all across the country began to organize. NEA leadership, meanwhile, was less than supportive. Executive Director William Carr feared that collective bargaining would undermine the professionalism of the organization and destroy public confidence in teaching. It wasn't until the American Federation of Teachers won a major representation election in New York City in 1961 that NEA leadership realized their strategic error. Demand for a new organizational focus on collective bargaining and greater teacher representation began to build. Finally, in 1971, the NEA Representative Assembly voted to convene a constitutional convention known forever as CONCON. A meeting of over a thousand delegates intent on setting a new course for the NEA. They met here on the campus of Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado in July of 1971. They were a diverse group representing the many political, philosophical, and geographical interests of the organization. And the work they accomplished in the Rocky Mountains that summer changed the course of the NEA forever. Control of the organization passed from administrators to teachers. 
membership was unified, meaning members who joined the association had to join at the local, state, and national levels. They couldn't pick and choose. And the importance of minority representation was written into the Constitution and guaranteed at the state and national levels. Almost overnight, the NEA went from being a rather genteel organization to a union of teachers that embraced collective bargaining and wasn't afraid of the more adversarial forms of collective action. CONCON opened the doors for more than just teachers. Less than a decade later, in 1980, education support professionals like me were granted full membership rights in the NEA. I'm Judy Neer, a health tech at Skyline Elementary School in Canyon City, Colorado, and I'm a proud member of the Colorado Education Association and the NEA. One of the principles that inspired the members of the Constitutional Convention is also one of the core values that guides our work today, and that's collective action. We believe individuals are strengthened when they work together for the common good. As education professionals, we improve both our professional status and the quality of public education when we unite and advocate collectively.